so what I want to do now is, uh, as I mentioned, let's continue on with our reading. I'm discussing our readings for the next 14 minutes and uh, for a little bit. We'll see how far we get. Emma has asked if we can stop 15 minutes early uh, for lunch. And then we, that gives you guys a little bit of time to eat, but also run over to the next building for your afternoon session. Let me know as this wonderful tropical rain continues. If you can't hear me, I can shout into the microphone, but you will really not want to be here. Okay, so just give me, let me know that you can't hear me. Okay, so we've been talking about an adaptive radiation, adaptive radiation uh, in general. Look, remember our overall uh, topic here is tempo. Of speciation, right? How fast can speciation actually proceed? Uh, how is it in all continuous kinds of um, origination of different lineages, or can it be episodic? Obviously, what we concluded from the African cichlids and that particular species complex or series of flocks, species flocks in those different lakes is that it obviously can be relatively quick and it can be explosive. 15,000 years, you have 450 different endemic forms, for example, in Malawi, Lake Malawi. And it appears that underlying each one of those explosive radiations in the lake uh, was a bout of hybridization, interbreeding hybridization. Okay, between river and forest. So what I want to turn our attention to now is an example from my own lab, and it's an example that was brought into my lab. It's a plant example that came into my lab through a postdoc, Scott Hodges, who's now an eminent professor, actually, in uh, California. And Scott came in with the following. Let me give you a little bit of background on this, okay? There was a series of papers that we put out in the mid-1990s. So Scott came into my lab as an, and I have to tell a, another bad mentoring story. We're friends still, too, which is amazing that I do this to people and they still come back. But Scott came into my lab as an evolutionary ecologist. He had worked for Spencer Bear. Um, Baker, sorry, and at Berkeley. And so Scott was a brilliant evolutionary ecologist. Scott is actually just a brilliant evolutionary biologist. He's smart as a whip. I mean, incredibly smart human being. But he wanted to come in to my lab, which is more of an evolutionary genetics lab, evolutionary genomics. And he wanted to learn how to do phylogenetic systematics, but also pattern and process within this plant species group, this species complex known as the columbines, which is the genus Aquilegia. And the genus Aquilegia, you would probably pick it up from, from this paper, maybe you already know this, but columbines have a wide array of pollinator syndromes, pollination syndromes. Some are bird pollinated, some are bee pollinated, small bee pollinated, some are fly pollinated, some are bumblebee pollinated, some are hop moth pollinated. So just a wide array of different kinds of flowers that these plants put up, floral forms that are seem to attract different pollinators. Scott's basic question was, and these are distributed around the world in temperate zones, okay, these species. And Scott's basic question was, if you have a bird pollinated form, hummingbird pollinated form, North America, did that bird pollinated form and bird pollinated forms elsewhere in the world arise from a single ancestor within the Aquilegia, or did you have bird pollination arising over and over and over again? It tells us something about speciation due to pollinator selection. That's really what he was interested in testing. So Scott came into my lab. Actually lived with, with my family uh, for a couple of months because we were so 
people trying to find him money for a stipend. And so uh, my wife just aside says he's, my son and I were there at the time when she said this, living in the house with Scott. She said he's the nicest male who's ever lived in my home. Uh, I found that relatively hurtful, but it was probably true. So anyway, so Scott's there. And what he does is, if, once again, this is 94, so we're really we're using PCR, but we're really not being able to sequence a huge number of loci. He goes away and amplifies a four class DNA and a little bit of nuclear DNA, sequences that should have varied quite a bit, accumulated mutations quite as quickly as we can expect from those kinds of DNA, i.e., it was in between genes, okay, internal transcribed spacer, ribosomal RNA, and the intergenic spacer regions between genes in the four class DNA, okay? And so those should have accumulated mutations much more rapidly, obviously, than the genes themselves. In fact, we know they do in various organisms, uh, various plants. So, Scott takes very, to start out, he takes DNA, isolates DNA from very different pollinator, pollinator syndrome types from very different geographic regions, okay? And he isolates the DNA, and he goes off to do the manual sequencing that we were all doing then. And he comes back a week or so later, because it always takes a long time when they're doing that. And he walks into my office and he says, I, I don't understand this. They're identical in sequence. And being the good mentor that I am, I said, well, you're an evolutionary ecologist. Obviously, you don't know what the heck you're doing in the bench, because you managed to contaminate your samples. And you amplified the same freaking sequence between the two when you did PCR. You can see why I'm a good mentor. And he said, fine, what do I do now? And I said, you go back and you do, you do it right. <laughs> this time, you don't contaminate your samples. So anyway, a week later, he comes back. And he said, they're identical. I sequenced them. I had another lab sequence them, a friend of his. They're identical. I didn't contaminate. So I apologized to him, told him he wasn't as big as an idiot as I said he had been, blah, 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 that I was. And so we sat down and we thought, well, we're ah, so much for ever getting any money again that we just got for you because now we can't do what we propose to do because there's no resolution. There's no phylogenetic resolution. So then Scott began to talk, and, and, and we had talked before about what might have caused the radiation, because it's considered an adaptive radiation in colophons, in the floral type, what might have caused radiation? And what did that radiation look like? And so Scott went out and sequenced many different species from within the clade of colophon, and he found the same pattern over and over and over again, very little sequence variation. To this day, that's what they find. Now they have a whole genome sequence from one of these species. Okay? Very little divergence among these very different ones in very different geographic regions. Okay? And so what we concluded here, okay, colophies, a geographically widespread species flock. That species flock idea that, that you have, that terminology means adaptive radiation, many different lineages. And in this case, it looked like it happened, we always laughed in the lab, it looked like it happened last Tuesday. Okay? No sequence variation, very little sequence variation. So very similar to the sequence in the root place. Okay? The problematic part of this is these are not in a single place, a single mountainside or a single set of mountains that are closely related or closely associated with one another geographically, these are spread all over the world. Okay. Why did we? The reason that we expected sequence variation is because other plants with this kind of morphological variation show sequence variation at these particular loci. The loci, they're non-coding. So we expected a 
certain level of sequence variation between highly morphologically divergent forms. That's why. That's why we expect it. That's why we expect it. Because other people have found that in plants with these kinds of morphological differences. So we were hoping for little sequence divergence, relatively small sequence divergence between bird pollinated versus hummingbird pollinated, or sorry, versus hawk moth, etc. In other words, they were all different individual progenitors. So the question is, is the same plant, could the same species share pollinators or have different pollinators, multiple pollinators? The answer is yes. They have a mating pollinator. So uh, like in our own irises, I'll show you guys back in the day, I uh, probably won't get to it today, but I'll show you guys evidence where we watch pollinators rip our normal types. Yes, they share pollinators. So a hawk moth pollinated will sometimes be pollinated at a low frequency by hummingbirds in North America, and vice versa, hummingbird pollinated at a low frequency by the hawk moth. Uh, and that's how you actually get interbreeding hybridization in this group. Low level, assorted of mating, mostly mating within the species due to pollinator selection as part of it. It's also a selection. So, yeah. Yes. Uh, so, what Scott has done with his whole genome sequencing and resequencing. Sort of, it's like the sequence that 2013 paper that we talked about in molecular ecology. He does have a level of resolution now that indicates that it probably is monophyletic for certain pollinator syndromes as opposed to other pollinator syndromes. But the inner nodes are still incredibly short. There's very few synaptomorphs. There's very few mutations that have accumulated. And the reason is, is because this is obviously an incredibly recent adaptive radiation, once again, like the sequence. Uh, it would probably take even more information, like in the sequence, probably millions of SNPs or tens of thousands of SNPs at least. And that's going to take a different kind of data, which you may be able to get actually with a new 15 generation sequence that we're able to up to now. Yeah, so uh, the question is, what about heavy alleles? And uh, uh, basically plasticity we're talking about now. Um, is that contributing to this? I've already told you guys that if you really want to go into something, if you're an evolution, want to be an evolutionary geneticist, um, going into the field of evolutionary epigenomics is a really good idea. I'm not doing that. So the answer is we don't know. We have no idea. Uh, but the, secondarily, what we can say is that for this, well, let me just ask it this way. So our Scott's hypothesis, finding this small amount of variation, but rapid and recent adaptive radiation, was that when we were talking about it in here, but this is just the very first paper from the NAS that had a series of proceedings society and other places too that we published but I, I know that doesn't look anything like a flat all right just give me a break not a good article and so he hypothesized that that the container for nectar and its variation in the link which is known okay is what drove this adaptive radiation potentially this this kind of a hypothesis with adaptive radiation is called key innovation. Okay, a key innovation. And 
So now we have questions. Theoretically, I would, and I'm, I'm not even sure that I should say theoretically, but I, we have to because we don't have the data yet. Theoretically, yes, epiallelic variation could could help these organisms to distribute across the environment. But please remember, we don't even know how many of these are transgenerational epigenetic effects. So far, we see the majority of them. Okay, so in other words, maternal effects go away. So if they sort it into those environments due to epi effects like that, they lose those epi effects in the next generation, and so they wouldn't be, you know, they wouldn't be able to occupy those niches. However, what I then want to say is, it only takes one kind of epi effect that is transgenerational that gives you that kind of what I'm called plasticity to affect those kinds of adaptations across generations. But what I also want to say is, this model doesn't depend, doesn't really have to depend on epi effects. This is not plasticity. This is actually allelic variation at a single locus, maybe at the most two. So what we can also say is that at four adaptive radiations, like the sympatric deviation, if you have allelic variation at a few loci that is sorting itself out across the environment due to natural selection or sexual selection, and we have this is not hypothesis, this is observation, then it doesn't take very many loci for this kind of thing to happen. The cichlid fish, it's an admixture of them. It may be many, many loci, but it's more likely to be the opposite genes in the female allelic variation, and then the color genes of males plus a few loci that affects how they feed. Major regulatory element. Darwin's finches, it's a major regulatory element that is circulating around that, yes, through admixture, but it's not a lot of loci that has to have to be buried. So the columbines in that sense are not that unusual. Right? There's not a lot of genomic differentiation between all of those 450 cichlids. Even though you started out with a hybrid storm, it's still, they're still quite similar to one another. So it's probably a few major loci by the looks of it for adaptive variations. Now, this was Scott's, going back to this, this was Scott's hypothesis. The nectar spur link bird variation was the key innovation. So what is a key innovation? What, what was suggested to be the key innovation in cichlids? It's probably part of the answer. Remember? Yeah, the, the way that the feeding apparatus, okay, probably only a portion of the answer. Okay, probably only a portion of the answer. Probably sexual selection from the experimentation and from natural observations now that was driving a good bit of the growth of the bit of that. Now, Scott knew that the clays and the lineages of related plants, semi aquilegia, etc., that are not part of this group, that are over here, they're out groups, that do not have a nectar spur. So, we know that the nectar spur grows here on this inner belt, leading to columns. What if it arose down here, and this reflects real time? Is it the key? Is it likely to be, or does that support, I should say, does that support the hypothesis of it being a key innovation? Why or why not? Okay. 
that's exactly the stronger inference if it was down to Kenner is that it's not cannibation or something had to happen during this time. But this was not the cannibation. Okay? And so determining something to be a cannibation is like determining why you have an adaptive radiation to be generally It's incredibly difficult. It takes a lot of additional information other than these plants are different from these plants in some character. So what do you have to do, do you think? What would Scott have to do to see where this actually arose? Phylogenetically, what would he have to do? If this is what he has so far, what would he have to do to see where this cannabation arose? I'm sorry, to see where the nectar spurs arose. What does he have to do in that long range? but also sometimes hard to see. What does he have to do in terms of this long branch if he can? Yeah, he has to shorten it somehow, which is exactly what Scott did. He started adding taps that still did not have a nectar spur. Okay? And those taps that he added Eventually, the nectar spur is very, the origin of the nectar spur and the common ancestor for these guys is very close to adaptive radiation. Okay? Correlatively, that suggests that, okay, it may really have been true. What else? What else do we need to know about nectar spurs? And how else can we just test them? How, how would you go about, okay, so now we have a correlation that says, well, yeah, but what, what do key innovations do, do you think, in terms of among these different lineages? What do they have to do to be a key innovation? What do they have to do in sympatric speciation if a mutation arises? has to lead to some level of reproductive isolation of sorted and mating. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you guys are smart as nuts. That's exactly the so let's I'm gonna get to your question in a moment. That's exactly what Scott did. And so first of all, we wanted to for a key innovation in general. To be a key innovation, by definition, it has to afford or cause a sort of mating between humans. And that's exactly what this does. That's known from experiments and from nature, where we look at for interest and hybridization and overlap zones between a hawk moth pubescence uh, form and a hummingbird. Uh, They overlap in nature, watching the pollinators and doing the genetics on them. We know there's interest and hybridization going on, but most of the, the matings and pollinations are within people's groups, right? There's a sort of mating due to spurling and other formal characters. Okay, so another thing you can do, you can ask, is how many species are in here and how many species are clades out here that don't have nectar spurs. Does this have a lot more species? Is it more species? In other words, if this is a key innovation, it needs to lead to radiations, higher levels, higher frequencies of lineages than in those organisms that lack the key innovation. By de that's a definitional thing. Okay? By the way, as an aside, what people wonder is how, in some ways, how does the feeding mechanism in cichlids, how did it lead to the sort of mating? So is it really a good key innovation? 
there are ways to think about that. Obviously, there's different theological tensions and so on. And, uh, but how do, how do they actually choose one another based on the two different groups and the way, the way that they're believing? So that's a difficulty with that being a key innovation. It may very well be, but that's a difficulty. All right, so he did that automatically and knew that the Colobites, in terms of their sister plays or sister lineages, Colobites had orders of magnitude when they had significantly more species than any of their sister plays. So what else would you do along those same lines? This may have been what you were talking about too. Just those Colobites who were acquisition and related plays, sister plays. What else would you do? other groups that have analogous structures, okay, nectar-containing structures, you can nectar spurge, you can call them, but groups that are not related to polybites at all or any of their sister plays, groups that are mints, groups that are whatever else kind of, of plays that you know are not closely related to these, but do have plays of organ of plant species that have a nectar spur like uh, structure versus sister plates that you know of. And you count the number of species, which is what he also did. What he found was a highly significant correlation, not perfect. And one of the examples he did not show this. But every other example he looked at, every other case he looked at where they had a nectar spur like structure in a clay versus in sister clays, those clays were, were significantly more species every time. Just like that. Yeah. So, uh, in species groups, bats, mammals, for example, is it reasonable to think that species groups relative to their less species plays, the species plays actually have a key innovation? Um, it is one hypothesis about how adaptive radiation is occurring. Okay, key innovations is one of open niches. Adaptive radiations with the radiations of mammals that can be KT mounted, we would say that that's likely due to edges opening up due to the catastrophic event. That's that's our work hypothesis rather than necessary. It could be all the above. Okay. It could be that could be the key innovation there and let them out distance reptiles or something like that that are still around. But it's just our working hypothesis is the asteroid strike actually opened up niches that were not there before. Okay, and that's where the mammals radiated from. Um, so there, are, you know, that's another hypothesis for adaptive radiation. So single fish was one of those suggestions was, and still are, that there were open niches and an empty clay can be laid face to those. Not necessarily a key innovation. Okay, now the, the hypothesis now is that Admixture leading to the sorting out of various molecules for sexual selection and ecological descent. So, um, so you can see there are a number of different models for how or why adaptive radiation is occurring. Okay.
yes, you're saying that the others will need to know that it's here as well, or are you? still a correlation. It's still a correlative kind of study. Now, he has done, he's published a nature paper not that long ago, where he's actually manipulated these to test the idea that they really cause a sort of mating due to their length. Ties them off. He puts different structures on the end of these flowers. He elongates them. He adds sugar. He does all these different things to see if it changes pollinator behavior, and indeed it does. So, he's done a and he's, of course, doing the population I will say something that Scott, if he hears about this, would tell me, but that's okay. I've said it so many times now, he will hear about it eventually. I think that this is probably the ad, an admixture of that too. Almost like the opposite genes in the, the females, cichlids, that you have an assorted mating. I think this may not be my point, but that's a guess based on what I've seen in other plants. I'm wondering if in years come, you know, to come where Scott has a lot more definition and he thinks more about this and his sense and actually tests for it, whether or not he's going to go, you know, this is just like golf shooters or the cichlid fish or whatever. I actually, my group actually started out with polymorphisms here from multiple lineages and a hybridization of them and a hybrid system. But let's get to the real problematic part of this, they're distributed worldwide. We assume that that worldwide distribution started here. It started at one place. But the real question to me still remains, how did you get an adaptive radiation that happened last Tuesday worldwide? When you don't have apparent adaptations for dispersal of seeds, that look like anything but either. They don't have dispersal mechanisms on the seeds. And yet, you start here, and then all of a sudden, you have however many species now that they suggest worldwide distribution. Different square lengths, different colors of flowers, so on and so forth. I mean, I'm sure Scott, I know Scott's thought much more about this. I still don't know. I, I really wonder about that. Regardless of whether or not this is an admixture of it here somewhere, that doesn't, geograph, biogeographically, that doesn't solve the biogeographic problem to me. Within a lake, you dump a few fish in, right, that are hybrid, and they sort themselves out. Uh, worldwide, you still have to get those seeds around there somewhere. 
very quickly. Yes. Yeah. So, so can pollinators really drive this? I think that the short answer is that in this particular group, um, observations and manipulations with different pollinator assemblages that Scott has done now, others have done other things, but he's done by manipulating this. But he's also manipulated all kinds of pollen positioning and things like that because some flowers are here hanging out like that, some of them that way, some of them up. It's painted them differently, and the pollinator preferences are quite affected by a number of different characteristics that are correlated to that. So I think it's more complex than just simply this. Um, however, assorted mating is definitely driven by the pollinators because the pollinators really, even though the long tongue could sit off, you know, a hawk moth with a tongue this long, whatever. Sit off away from a short spurt of the plant, they just don't do it very long. You know, when you observe them, and also when you, that they don't do that. So they're, they're sharing pollinators, but like our irises and other plants that have different pollen forms, uh, they're largely assorted mating for different reasons and assorted mating and pollinating. Uh, but the other part of this is that looking at the genomics, uh, there's intergressive hybridization going on, but it's, it's less frequent. Demonstrates this assorted mating. Now, in addition, we know in another paper that was published, um, I think maybe Brian just if I can't remember, he was at the NAS as well, it's close to this day, um, where Scott actually looked at the hybrid zone to the downside of the hybrid zone. Yes, okay, one could have a different pollinator, uh, uh, pollination center. In addition to the pollinators, you did have ecologically setting differences, right? One's more shapely, one's more fluffy, and those plants are in different ecological settings. So that has to be driving part of this too. So um, is this a key innovation? I think because of both meta-analysis and this, I think it, I think it absolutely is. Uh, strongest evidence that I've ever seen for a key innovation that would actually with his testing here to drive, to drive home the assorted of mating effect. I really think it really highly likely is affecting reproductive isolation in this group. Is it the only thing? Absolutely not. They're, they're adapted to different ecological settings. Each one of these species is adapted. That we've looked at, he's looked at, is adapted to something else, not just pollinators. Pollinators are part of the ecological setting. It's good for them. It is good for them. Other questions? Or there's no stand up ones that may end up at 1245 or something. Like that. Okay, not that we can do. So please raise your hand. Okay, other questions or comments about this? It's time to study.
Bush stops here and argues in this scenario, which is that what I just said, the foreign policy is still hamstring weakness, it's still a lack of momentum. How does it really help us sustain the So, so the biotech brand is also a rather than particularly entertaining. <laughs> There's a lot of allelic This The reason I say that, like the opsin genes and like the adaptive trait transfers that Mr. Meg and I have written up in the Two Three One Tree, usually because very often they're very simple. Okay, and then they're affected by multiple loci, but this, when you do the, when Scott and others do the genetic process, this acts as if it's a single. How did this single locus, or maybe a couple of loci, have that amount of allelic variation in a single lineage? I'm starting to doubt those kinds of adaptive radiation scenarios where it's a single lineage that just has the same basic uniformity. Okay, so I mean, I would, I, I am not pushing this. Like, I don't write about this in my book, you know, hypothesize this because, you know, I don't want to, first of all, I don't want to scoop that idea of Scott's thinking about it. But when I teach these kinds of short courses, I mention that I just wonder if that's not a possibility in the back of the system. Once again, because these kinds of examples are building up where you can have this kind of admixture event underlying a whole X, Y, or Z plants and animals. And so now we're testing those kinds of things. One of these days I'm going to write him an email and say, is it possible? We talked about it at one point in time before that we were stopped for that sort of conversation. But I'm going to, now that they have all their population genomics and their resequencing, I'd like to revisit that with them and say, is, just out of curiosity, do you think it's possible to sort of see it now and see what it is, et cetera, et cetera? Because I'd love to see you write it up it in nature or something as, hey, you know, this is really what the real deal is. Yeah, there's maybe negative spur variation and other loci that are associated with ecological uh, setting, um, but uh, that admixture came, uh, sorry, that amount of variation came from admixture between standing genetic variation between ancient ecosystems and these new variants. But I don't know. I'm just, I'm just hypothesizing uh, in our general discussion of rapid evolution of it being a kind of advantage. Speciation genes uh, that have been detected. Snapdragons, uh, the same sort of thing. Uh, sunflowers. Uh, now, the traits they're affecting uh, vary in terms of the uh, causing the sort of invading because what I just mentioned, uh, those plants have very different ways of doing their job, right? And pollinators and non pollinators and whatever else. So there are definitely there are definitely regions of the genome that have been located in, in all of those examples and others that seem to affect the sort of invading and even will refer to them as speciation genes or speciation loci. Could be one of two much more simple cases. But I have a colleague working on amphibians and one of the it's not a sort of invading, but it's actually in viability in hybrids. And they still have integration going on in natural hybrid zones, but it greatly limits that because of one locus that they've narrowed down to just a few genes, and they know 
what they do is set up a baby. And the baby is all of those genes, but it's probably one kind of gene that looks like that. They sort themselves out. Here's my problem with the idea of speciation genes. Krishna may address it at one point in the last year, so we've discussed this topic. I, I look at, I know that this is a simple genetic trait, one of the many genes, what we could say. But I still go back to the famous question about, well, is it really only that? And I just don't think it's only that. And I, Scott doesn't think it's only that. But it, he does feel like it's a major driver of this because of the kinds of analysis he's done. So, they're not conserved, per se, right? They actually have to be polymorphic. So, in one sense, they're not conserved in sequence. So, those loci are not conserved in in sequence. In fact, for this kind of variation, we would say they are highly variable relative in this. Remember, there's very little sequence divergence among these different species of polymides. So these actually would be highly variable. Uh, this locus, let's say it's one locus, would have a lot of alleles, a lot of mutations that accumulated there. Now, why I go back to the admixture question is the, a lot of mutations accumulated there may have been at different divergent lineages down there that actually were admixed, but still, it's still a lot of variation, quite a bit of variation. So in terms of what affects mendels, lead to inviable, you know, codlinals, uh, or, sorry, codlinals without any chloroplasts in them, that is probably a simple trait that still has a lot of variation compared to other ones. And so as that sorts out, you can end up with this kind of radiation. So we actually expect the reverse in radiations, which is that you have an enormous amount Relatively speaking, a lot of variation in both sides that lead to that kind of assorted mate, ecological settings, etc., relative to other loci. Crossing experiments actually long before Scott went to this. Um, gosh, who's the authors? Anyway, it's 
securities laws are sort of the laws of the environment. They're the ones who uh, protected a segregation ratio in the hybrid office way that suggested a single focus. And it's held up in other lawsuits. But it could be confirmed because those, those segregation ratios are sloppy enough to maybe be does not mean it's too ingenious. I mean, I encourage you to remember that. Because we're talking about segregation ratios that, yes, it's two at the most, it appears to be two genomic regions, but if there are no crossing over events in there, it means greater formation of hybrids, or even if you're looking at lineages of Sulfur or whatever else that you're crossing, if there are no crossing over events in there, you won't detect how many, exactly how many best way to do it is to do genomics and transformation of events in there. what I said until Ole Seehausen, in fact, let, let me give you an anecdote. Ole Seehausen publishes his Trends in Ecology and Evolution paper back in 2010 or more. I can't remember. 2002, 2004. I don't know. Something like that. Peter Grant and I were at a meeting and one of the groups that Ole Seehausen proposed was a hybrid swarm generated adaptive radiation. It was Darwin I still remember sitting over dinner or beer or wine or something with Peter Graham, and he said, what do you think about Ole Seehausen's hybrid storm hypothesis? And I said, you know, it's going to be so hard to test, but I just don't buy it that every adaptive radiation out there is due to introgressive hybridization. I know that sounds funny coming from me. But anyway, I did. I said, I just, I don't know. I've always thought about it as an individual lineage, and it relates has this allelic variation, phenotypic variation in the expression of the And Peter said, yeah, yeah, I feel the same way. But we were both really, really wrong. Okay, at least about his finches. <laughs> um, I feel good about the fact that he was wrong about his finches. Um, but it's been very recent. And so it's been a recent paradigm shift for me to even think Consider that adaptive radiations could be driven by admixture, that we even have to worry about that. And I was teaching an undergraduate evolutionary biology and my speciation course during the early 2000s, okay, and up until probably 2010 maybe. Still not buying that adaptive radiations are probably likely due to, potentially likely due to admixture. So this is a real recent change in my own so all I can tell you is the more information that's coming out, behavioral information from animals, uh, genomics, et cetera, from plants and animals, it looks like more and more examples of admixture, I should point to this, admixture underlying these kinds of adaptive radiation is becoming more and more clear. But once again, not a lot of tests Explicitly, I think, test it well, test that hypothesis well, that it didn't cause it. But it looks like, probably, I bet you we're going to find out that under every adaptive radiation is a hybrid. Have there been I'm aware of actually is OLA's word models and how you test them in the 
that tree manuscript, once again, you can look it up. If you have that, if you have a copy of my book, you can look up Seehausen, like 2004, and I think it's called The Highbrook Storm, or The Fury, or something like that. It's the title of it. And um, he, he gives, I mean, he is very explicit, and he's very honest, but I think these kinds of data, the test is, it's almost like reading As far as I know, he hasn't done any theory on it, like algebra, calculus, but maybe, uh, maybe I've missed something, but I, I don't know. You should know the answer. I'm serious. I always point out to you guys, ideas for probably, you know, ideas for like many reviews and things would be found fundamentally important. When we talk about interest democratization, I'm going to tell you another one that you need to I've been asked why for years, and I still don't know why I can't see the phenomenon that I'm seeing. We'll talk about that later. And I will encourage you that I'll be dead soon, so you need to do these sorts of things. Do it quick so I can cite it. But, you know, there's a, you know, seriously, if I'm not a theoretician. It really only is that he's, a, he's an analyst, and he's an experimental biologist. He does, he understands calculus, and he understands theory. But he's not a theoretician, and I'm not either. So it's going to take somebody, these kinds of models, if you are of that ilk, and this seems like a good, you know, you hear something, do the theory. Work on the stuff you know is, is excellent. It helps us to learn empiricism. It helps us to understand sort of how to test maybe the assumptions of your model. Keep generating, you know, be an epigenomics, do this, do that, because I don't do it. You need me to do it. I need to be able to cite what you learn. It's so much more important. Okay, other questions, comments? Okay, let's finish. We have about 15 minutes. Let's go ahead and, once again, other questions about Axel Meyer's work and the cichlids. So, the anecdote, and I've already told you this, I think, but I'm going to tell you again. The anecdote about this, this came out in 2012. So, I think about 2010, because it takes a while, as we all know, it takes a while to get contributed volumes together. They did a really, actually, a really good job on this one, um, because they got it out relatively quickly. 2010, we were asked, in 2012, this book would be that's actually phenomenal and fast. You guys probably know. You have a contributed volume, and it's like it takes nine years to get out. By the time it comes out, everybody else has written for you. You were trying to find or did write for you. But in this case, the anecdote I want to tell you is about me. And that is that these guys, these, these editors of this uh, volume, asked me, to, they contacted me. I didn't know them. But they contacted me and said, you know, something like, hey, we know you work on natural hybridization, and uh, you've done work on that, and we're putting this volume together on rapid evolutionary change. And it wasn't just natural hybridization, obviously. The, the file you have has all of the, the way they sent it to me has each of the references. So you can look and see what all they were talking about in terms of rapid change, motivating rapid change. So they said, would you write a, a, a chapter, you know, if an author is Trevor, would you write a chapter on rapid evolutionary change due to natural hybridization? And I think I've already told you this. And I said to them, well, I don't really know why it would necessarily have to be rapid versus slow versus whatever it is. So this is 2010. A lot of paradigm shifting for me, obviously, over my life by other people pointing out the leading obvious in these kinds of things. And so I, got, I went back and I started thinking about it. And I thought, said this to me, and I realized if you have natural hybridization generated evolution, it is by definition going to be rapid. Absolutely, by definition, it has to be rapid. And the reason is, is because we know from experimentation that in natural hybrid zones between 
obviously natural hybridization, we're talking about eukaryotes. So genetic exchange between different plants through sexual reproduction in nature or in the lab produces hybrids of varying thinness and selection very quickly weeds out, pun intended, those genotypes and phenotypes that are not fit, uh, some genotypes and phenotypes are good for others, uh, genotypes and phenotypes of uh, hybrids actually have an elevated fitness relative to their parents in certain environments or in fossil environments. We'll talk about that later too when we get back to that. So, but it happens within a few generations. So by definition, it has to be rapid. That, at least that pulse, has to be rapid. And so I came back and said to him, yeah, yeah, okay, this makes sense for me to think deeply about this because I had not, I really had not, because once again, I was incredulous that it had to be rapid. So in that sense, natural hybridization, generated evolutionary change, is rapid. Okay? All of us. Okay. Both directions in what sense? Absolutely, it can lead to rapid loss of biodiversity as well. Um, and we have good examples of that. Generally, um, those examples, overall, the wealth of examples is in animals because conservation biologists, meaning who are focusing on this, normally are working on zoological. Terms of what we see in nature, though, uh, the diversity largely increases with each of those, but it can go the other way. Like I say, so many different Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes, it does lead to what we refer to as disruptive selection. That's correct. That's correct. So in your original, say, back cross water F2 hybrid population, you have many different genotypes that would not, they would be removed. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Plants and animals actually, uh, when you get the, I have to talk to you about that. I keep saying that. That's fine. So when you get that, look up in basin in the in the um, subject, okay, in the back of the book, and you'll have some examples there of, that I talked about. But yes, and there's actually even whole books that have been written by like Laura Melser about invasiveness and increase in invasiveness due to interest in hybridization of plants and some animals. They focus on plants. But ELSTRAND, E L L S T R A N D, is not. And if you want to send me an email, I won't be able to respond to it probably before I leave for the day, but while I'm in the day, I can send you. If you want to send me an email and say, hey, do you have PDFs of invasive, uh, on invasiveness due to hybridization? I'll look at that and send you some things. But if you look in the book, if you look in the the subject in the back, you'll see some some examples that I discussed. But yes, we do have examples, and um, but those are it's not always due to interest in hybridization. I don't think <laughs> it's like it's not rapid, or it doesn't have to be rapid. We think it's not. Questions or comments about this? More questions or comments about this topic? Finish out. Finish out today. This morning, my session.
not that I know of. So, uh, having worked as a mammalogist for six years, you know, when I was an undergraduate and graduate student, one of the, and I use it actually in evolutionary biology, you know, the, the terminology behind that, so going down to Panamanian histories, so that sort of thing, uh, before we moved to mammalogy. And so, uh, that sort of, a, once again, we can think of it as a semi-permeable membrane, letting certain mammal groups back to the group that's sort of south of certain what we see culturally in situ. Uh, but I don't know of anyone right now is who is looking at that? Could some of the diversification that we see, some of the adaptive radiation that we see, we have, I've been in a number of different countries speaking and doing research down there. Last year I was there only on three of the meetings that I've been to and I've read written some pieces for them since I came back up, well, not back up, since I went back to the state. The scientists there are really locked into the biological species concept of allopathic biology. They have been for decades. And much of that comes from Theodosius and Janvey in North America who have trained a number of the scientists there. And so their evolutionary uh, biology pedigree does not leave them test those kinds of questions. And when I have interacted with them, they um, explicitly told me it's unimportant. I mean, interest hybridization in general is unimportant. And it even has led primatologists there to vastly, I mean, an order of magnitude underestimate the level of interest hybridization in primates that they now realize using even smaller groups is so it's, it's got a pedigree to it that I'm not, it hadn't been tested. Once again, it's like cichlid fishes or whatever else, you know, if we don't think it's there, we're not going to look for it or test for it because it's, it, it's unimportant. We don't want to waste our time doing that. So it's understandable. But we're actually writing a review right now based on a meeting that they asked me to come down and do uh, talk to three different evolutionary courses at Daniel Cornell and they short courses at Daniel Pino, from those meetings they want to write about what is the likelihood and what are the important questions we need to look at in terms of this group definition of sexual So it's exciting, but we just don't have the data on it yet. We may even have the data in some cases about it now, but do we really have the data on group definition of sexual assignment? Well, we do, but why would we? It's understandable why it happens. It's really understandable. By the way, I know maybe it seems strange to you that I bring up historical contingency and philosophical and sociological kind of limitations to our science, but it's not just evolutionary biology. It's physics, it's chemistry, it's whatever else. When we know something doesn't occur, we're not going to test for it and we're not going to give it Somebody actually breaking in and going, uh, excuse me, it could occur, and it is occurring, and it's occurring at this frequency, and people start to look for it. So, there is a sociological aspect to this that you can't really see in the same by itself. Okay, other, other, other questions? If you see something, and actually I did something to David, just a little spiel. Okay, if you see something or I say something about the paper, the publication, and you go, I really would like to see that, and just drop me an email and specifically tell me what you're looking for. Remember, don't say, hey, Mike, would you send me the PDFs that you talked about in two or something. I won't write you back and say, are you insane? 
and I'll tell them this story. I really want to. But, you know, tell me if you need something. You know, like I was telling you, and I really will respond very quickly. As I say, when I was trekking in the Himalayas last year for 10 days with my wife, Frances, we went to 100 kilometers and went up to 5,000 meters, and the whole way we were looking at the tips of the top of my iPhone. She pointed out that I was on vacation. Repeatedly, she pointed out that I was on vacation. Repeatedly, she pointed out I was on vacation and I needed to stop doing that. So I did. I like my work. So anyway, just please feel free to do that. Don't feel like you're in the business of me. I'm here to help and do whatever I can. And if that's something you want to help me with, let me know. Okay. Time for one more question. And read the book. Yeah, we can do that. I said you hate to leave this. Read the book. Okay, what if what else? Any any other questions before we move on? All right. We'll stop here uh, mid lunch and then you guys are shifting buildings so they can know where they're going to be.